Today's lecture, to, today's lecture is about lime kilns. Now, the, the thing is with lime kilns, it sounds like an extremely boring subject. However, the lime kiln itself is one of the staple foundations of humanity. And that's not an over-exaggeration. Lime itself, as we'll refer to it, the product from limestone, after it's been placed into the kiln, to talk very crudely, has so many applications. It's got medical applications, it can be spread on fields, it can be used in the building industry, it can be used in war. It's got so many applications that uh, beyond uh, water, lime is probably one of the most useful products on this planet. Um, and Dorothy's right. If you've got diseases out there, it's good for getting rid of diseases. Why do you think people paint um, trees on the continent uh, with lime to get rid of diseases? Lime is used on the um, hooves of animals to uh, get rid of diseases. Lime is used um, as a disinfectant. Lime has so many applications. So, um, after struggling to try and work out whether this was going to be interesting, I found out that it did jolly well interesting. And in fact, there's an important point made probably towards the end. And the point is this. Um, lime was probably being used for a variety of purposes and it started back as far ago as 14,000 years ago. Kilns that were high enough to get temperatures of 900 degrees C. So it makes my lecture about pottery rather redundant when I made the statement that you probably didn't start making pots until about 9,000 years ago. If you've got kilns that are able to uh, break down the properties of limestone and to create lime using temperatures at 900 degrees C, it doesn't take a leap of imagination that they would have used that to heat uh, clay to create pottery a lot earlier than I said. But you won't find that written down. It's an obvious link. Uh, this is a, a lime kiln. Uh, this is very Turneresque, uh, probably dated from about the 1800s. I don't know who the artist is. You'll probably be able to find it out quickly on the internet. Uh, but this is one of those um, various um, illustrations that you would see of um, earlier forms of manufacture in Britain. Um, lime kilns uh, was one of those sources of manufacture that employed um, some of the highest numbers of people in any industry in Britain. Um, now it's an industry that employs people um, like companies like Lafarge, um, and port oh, and cement. cement. Oh, cement companies. That's my, all my cement companies. But very few people work in those industries today. But back in the day, um, you would have had tens of thousands of people working in the limestone industry um, at any said uh, regional location. I thought I have seen one, one, one limestone from a distance. Lime kiln. Going to Swansea from Bridge End. On your right hand side, you can see all the scalings, all the, all the lime scalings lying there. Oh, yeah. Have you yeah. ever seen that? Yeah. That, that was a. It's in a uh, uh, sort of farm and that's a, Yeah, it's, it's no redundant part of it. Now, this image itself is atypical of an archaeologist uh, producing an image which is absolutely wrong. Um, so it's good to correct something that is wrong, but I'm going to start off with a little story. Now, you've all had your newsletters, hopefully by now, um, and we've probably got one left to give Jim, I think, but um, our, our adventures in Lantwerp Major uh, have taken uh, the line that we've now worked out that um, where you find the town hall in Lantwerp Major, uh, in the east, is the secular part of the town, basically where everybody lived. But in that secular part of the town where the common people would have lived, that's where the common people would have mined their limestone. But on the opposite side of the valley, 
in Landswick Major, where the church is now positioned at the bottom of that valley. On the opposite side is Old Cherokee land, ecclesiastical land, and that's where the church made their money. There was great competition in Landswick Major um, for who was going to be able to trade their limestone and the product lime itself. It was quite easy and safe. And the word safe, you'll understand why in a, in a few moments' time. Uh, it was much easier to just um, export limestone blocks. Some of our best limestone is carboniferous limestone, 250 million year old block, or 150 million year old blue lice limestone, which isn't as good, but it does the job. And the, the blue lice limestone is the stuff um, that is now um, being quarried at Aberthaw to create your Portland cement. Now, with all this said, why would we export limestone blocks to Devon? Because they don't have any limestone. They don't have um, any limestone that they could then reduce to the calcium oxide form, which is the lime itself, to spend on their fields, to use in pharmaceuticals, to use in building. They needed our limestone. So you can imagine there was a great deal of competition in Lanthrop Major before the dissolution of the monasteries which hit Lanthrop Major in 1540 between the church and the people who lived on the opposite side of the valley. You can imagine we want to sell our um, export to um, Watch It Bay, for example, and the church is saying, actually, we want to trade with them instead. So it, it was one of those staple products. A staple product is something that is, is a main export of a country. And our staple product, particularly in the South, was limestone. You can imagine the poor, um, the very poor, disheveled wrecker. Um, wrecking a ship that contained limestone. I'm sure it'd be quite devastated. Um, and then still slaughter everybody on board that ship at the same time. But um, the fact of the matter is, limestone does have so many applications. And um, you could refer to that as the mouth, uh, or the secondary eye, and you could refer to this as the drawing line. Uh, and what's wrong about this image is quite simple. And I encourage you to know if you produce this. Um, when you uh, produce um, a limestone kiln, in a limestone quarry, you're not going to um, line it with sandstone. And that's certainly not going to be sandstone if it's a limestone quarry. Mistake one. Mistake two is this. Underneath there, there would be a metal grate. So you're able to place a fire. And the directly above that would be coal or charcoal, directly above that would be limestone. Coal, there would be alternating levels of equal width. If you had a kiln like that and you lit it, you may as well just leave it forever because it just wouldn't work. Um, the archaeologists who produced this um, diagram got one thing right. This individual is well covered up. That's based on archaeology as well. And the whole process of this is that as the lime is dropping uh, through the metal grate after it's been burnt, this drawing eye, the drawer himself or herself, would draw the lime out. I'm using the word lime, um, but there are many um, words that we'll come up with that refer to um, the byproduct of this industry, okay, when you produce the limestone blocks. So what we need to do, we need to, we need to charge us up. Um, and I think we need to charge us up um, with the fact that I need to get my, uh, my thingamajig. My thingamajig? Thingamajig. I'm going to get the bottom of that. Well, basically, uh, I, will, I will show you uh, another image. I'm not sure if you can tell me What that is? Yes. No, no, they're not the ship. They're the actual blow unit. Is that them? No, I thought it was the unit, the whole unit. What, what is that? Oh, what's the wall? Uh, actually, actually, that, that's, um, 
Yeah, that's very wrong as well. Uh, basically, whoever drew this didn't. I didn't have an understanding of a lime kiln because that that's what we're talking about. That's what we should be talking about. Yeah. That 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 looks much better, doesn't it? So mm. the prop. This is this is the thing with interpret interpreting images properly. Sometimes um, you go on the internet and it says this is that and that is this, and it's completely wrong. But people believe it. Now. I, I've, got, I've now got my internet access, which is absolutely fab, um, which we managed... Why don't you take your questions? Why don't you take your questions? Look at this. Bingo. See, like this, it happens. It happens quite well. This is flowing quite well now. Um, now, the reason why we're doing this thing here, lime kilns in Cumbria, okay? Yeah, why? Is, why? Yeah. Let me show you this. More work has been done on lime kilns in Cumbria, that's why. And Cumbria has exact is a very similar geology to us. Okay? And and that that ge geology um, is this here, this green band here. This green band is here is Carboniferous limestone. And our Carboniferous limestone in the Vale of Gamorgan and Bridgend is very much like this. It's all over the place. You either get it or you don't. Um, this is um, Magnesian limestone, which is in little areas, which you can hardly see on the chart. In fact, I can't even see it. Um, and all the rest of the landscape, um, for example, the millstone, uh, which are these here, are no good for, you can't, you know, that there's no lime in millstone. Um, and looking at the plan as well, uh, this conglomerate, so this down here is also limestone, okay, limestone pebbles. So these areas here, these strips, are absolutely perfect along the coast and all the rest of it. These are absolutely perfect um, for what we need in those lime kilns. Um, so we're studying this area because it's very similar to the Vale of Morgan and, and Bridgend. Um, and everything that this article says could be talking about this area. So this is why we're doing it. Um, and also, the other point is, well, this is actually, um, I teach my Cumbrian class this as well. So this has kept everybody happy, thank, thank God for doing this. Um, so here we go. Um, the, the limestone itself, okay, we don't have any limestone in the room, but this structure, um, oh, it's made of sandstone, never mind. Um, most, uh, most, oh, that there is limestone, okay? So that's your limestone. That, that's your, um, I do believe that's your blue lias limestone. I need to look a bit closer. That there is blue lias limestone, and this building outside is made of sandstone. So that's the difference. Now, as you can see, this is why this article is very similar to this landscape because it talks about similar things. Uh, the the limestone that surrounds the Lake District is a sedimentary rock laid down underwater in the Carboniferous period. So what's basically happening? is in the great oceans of the past 350 million years ago, um, floating across the water um, are, the, are the dead skeletal remains of trillions of little um, creatures um, with a bone structure. And those calcareous bone structures and the gastropods and the brachiopods, which are um, a, a, a shellfish with, with a shell, they all actually fall down to the ocean bed and they fall down Mud falls down, other bits fall down, and it gets compacted and compacted and compacted and compacted. And then, um, A up, about, um, about 250 million years ago, all that's forced up to the surface, okay? And all that material that's forced up to the surface is the Carboniferous rock, okay? And that remains as our mountains, like Flatow, uh, parts of the Snowdonians, the Brackens, and all the rest of it. All that, all that stuff is thrown up, okay, with some of the very old rocks as well. Um, and then um, millions of years later, when human beings need this product and realise it's so important, they start quarrying it, heating it up, um, and so on. So what, what's exactly going on? Okay, what is going on? Um, and you can, um, you'll be able to see the use, some of the uses of um, limestone as it start, starts to um, break out. But you can use um, calcium carbonate, okay, also as a flux in smelting. So if you're a blacksmith, um, um, calcium carbonate, i.e. 
Um, the rock itself, that rock itself, once it's ground up, is, is useful as a flux in smelting. So that's another use. So this, this, this interesting thing, okay? And I'm reading this out of wood, but it's kind of easy. So calcium, um, calcium carbonate, okay, um, is heated at 900 to 1000 degrees C, which is that stuff out there. That there is calcium carbonate. Why it's being heated up? It uh, becomes this calcium oxide, and oxide is basically a density material. Okay, so like, um, um, oh God, like uh, red oxide, red oxide, you can just write down, rust, that's an oxide, so I need to get that word out there, rust, that's an oxide. Um, once it's an oxide, <coughs> it's then referred to as quick lime, or just lime, okay? Now this is where this whole lecture gets confusing, because the word lime is used um, for when water is added to it. When it's slate, okay. So when it's when it's when you add water to it, it returns back to um, calcium carbonate. So go back to this. When when it's that white powdery stuff, quick lime or just lime, a white and porous powder, um, as it's drawn out of the kiln, and it's allowed to cool, but it has a little bit of a bite to it. If you've got some of this um, calcium oxide on your hands and you rub your eyes, if you rub your eyes too much, you will never have your sight return because it then reacts with water and it heats up and it burns your skin. It really, really burns. And you know this, George, as much as I, okay, you do not um, handle um, quick lime without gloves on. And you do not handle quick line without a mask or something covering yourself, particularly when you're building. Um, and you don't scratch your eyes either. Um, if it's not, like, as you're drawing it from the kiln, okay, it either comes out as a powder or it comes out in lumps. As soon as water hits it, it reacts. And, it, and it, at the temperature, uh, goes to around uh, 200 a degree centigrade. You know, if you're adding water, you actually do not have <coughs> like sort of uh, this big swell of this gin is just going to be too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Found a problem for one. Anyway. Pork should have used it a lot. You know the fish? Yeah. Okay. Don't you mean tablets out of it? Yes. Yes. I did say medicinal. Um, so here we go. The slate, slate, Right, Not write this down. Calcium oxide, um, when water's added, it's the word used is slate. It's been slate. Okay? And what happens is this. You've got this powdery material, right? This powdery material. It's not hot, not the room temperature. You add water to it and it basically um, boils. boils, right? And if there's any wood nearby, it will set fire to that wood. It boils. It goes so hot that people have had this stuff in carts. It's bad in the rain and they have to run because they can't set a light. This is one of the weird um, um, areas of chemistry. Water itself creating fire. So don't go there. I, I can't work it out myself. But there's there's a reaction. Um, now, this this itself. The slate lime has numerous uses. Liming sour land, we'll talk about that in a short while. Making cements and mortars. Manufacture of bleaching powder, bleaching paper, manufacture of caustic soda, glass manufacture, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and even poaching. Thanks for that. See, there's so many applications, we can go on all day. Um, now, when we think about this, okay, when, when you've got um, calcium carbonate stones and it's attacked by carbon dioxide, um, both of them react and then the architecture itself starts to decay. That's what that's saying. Dissolved basically by acid rain. Now, here we go. 
This, this, is, this, is, this is a statement about 150 years old. Some of it is right, some of it is wrong. But think about the mindset of how people were seeing limestone and then it being turned into lime, okay? Slaked lime. It's only slaked lime when you add water. Before that, it's quick lime. But for the sake of argument, from now on, we'll just refer to it as lime, okay? If you, if you add the water to the lime, it becomes slaked lime. If it remains in a bag without water, it's referred to as quick lime. But as we all know, moisture gets into everything. And eventually, it'll heat up. It's, it's, it's a very strange reaction because um, you can have this thing, um, you don't put it in a wooden, wooden bucket, okay? Because if you put it in a wooden bucket, a little bit of moisture gets in and the bucket sets alight. It's very corrosive as well. But if you're able to put it into a container, it can last for a long time, and you open it, put water with it, you can use it to build it. Um, so here we, you go. Thomas West describes the appearance of limestone pavement nicely. All the way up there in Cumbria. Limestone pavement is a natural rock. Limestone has all the appearance of having been once in a soft state. He had that right. Um, and easily soluble in water. This principle will account for the um, scallops on the surface of the limestone rocks being made perhaps by the water draining off while the stone was soft, which is in fact incorrect. He, he forgot about natural erosion. What we're talking about in places like uh, Derbyshire, Northumberland and Cumbria, they have these lad landscapes with just endless limestone paving. That's what he's describing. Also from the chinks and crevices amongst them made by the shrinking together when dried by the sun. And that's the caves themselves proceed most probably from a great part of the rock being dissolved and washed down uh, by the streams and um, pervading the different strata. That's something of what um, Bill was on about. Translation of that, which is very confusing. Um, um, he, he was, he didn't understand that this rock was formed millions of years ago. Um, he believed that what he could see now today was formed, um, not it was formed not in the present, um, but in the past, um, but in the far distant past. Those limestone pavements were actually created, and then you go on to um, the caves. He goes. Uh, you talk about the caves themselves. Um, uh, stalag stalactites and stalagmites form um, from the solution which is washed away um, from the holes to make the caves, which Bill was on about. So when, when uh, acid attacks the limestone in the caves, it creates the caves themselves, and then the byproduct then itself, which is calcium bicarbonate solution, creates stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, something to what Bill just mentioned. So we, we've mentioned, uh, we, we've looked at that plan, but now what I want us to do um, is I want us to look at that first, that, that lot of information, and then we'll come back to that. Use of lime. Among many uses of lime are lime dressing. Lime dressing is not something you put with a salad or what you wear to go out with. Uh, lime dressing is, is um, the term used for agricultural use um, to sweeten sour land. Okay, so in other words, when the land is acidic, okay, um, for example, when you get red soil, I don't know if any of you have got red soil in your garden, but if you've got red soil in your garden, it's acidic, okay? If you add limestone to it, bingo and Monmouthshire, yes, you've got it. Yes, yes, you've got to add lime to it to deal with the acid. That's very important. Lime mortar, lime slaked, so it's um, when you add water to it, so it's slaked when you add water, uh, creates a putty which can be mixed with sand to make a mortar which sets hard as it reverts to calcium carbonate. So in other words, that's broken down to create calcium oxide. When you add water to it, it wants to revert back to its normal state. Here's an important fact. Um, in, in the um, today, um, we, we use a lot of um, cement, okay, the normal process cement. 
And when you add water to it, it sets it solid. But the problem is it doesn't breathe. Um, and when um, cement actually sets, um, it sets for good. Whereas lime itself, in its, in its cruelest form, okay, in its base form, um, continues to set for 10, um, or starts to set for hundreds of years. Okay, so we know that some of the masonry that was used to build Tudor houses is still setting today. Because it, it breathes. It gradually gives off gases, but very, very slowly. And it basically wants to revert back to its normal rock. And whenever you're building with uh, lime, you've got to do about two or three courses at a time and then leave it to let it set for a little while. Then you do two or three more courses and you let it set for a little while. This is why when people are doing limestone, um, when people are building walls um, using lime mortar, um, they always put um, a bit of carpet on top of it. So it allows it to breathe, but it doesn't let the uh, rain go in there to affect the lime that's actually setting. Lime wash, white wash, to waterproof walls and plaster chimneys. I've got a nice little story associated with this. Went to Langone one day in the Bay of the Morgan. And, um, and right, right at the top of the Bay of the Morgan, actually. And when I went to Langone, I lived in this house. Langone. Inside the churches and the line render. Why why dare, you know, they dare do it. And in doing that, they, they take away the history of the church, and then the church stops breathing. Damp gets into the church. Uh, and the, the Victorians soon realized, and the Victorians made a massive rod for their own backs. They ripped out all this stuff, um, the interior and exterior of the church, all wonderfully whitewashed, lovingly over decades and hundreds of years. Um, and then they realised that they were very damp. So then they had to um, put central heating systems in there. They used to rip out the centre of the church, also damaging the churches further. And then that central heating system needed ventilation. And that by the end of it, uh, ten, uh, but not tens of thousands, but thousands of churches in Britain were affected that way. Um, and it completely destroyed the character of these churches. When in fact the, the lime wash itself was a very important element in that character. Because it was a natural element. And it allowed the, the walls to breathe. And I said this today in my, um, my lecture at Lancet Major. Um, the, and it, it's, a, it's a dreadful parallel, uh, but it's something that we don't learn. Um, the, 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 the tower block in uh, Kensington, which went up in flames, over 80 people died. Um, and it was simply because um, they, they were using a new material, polystyrene with cladding on the outside. Okay? Um, which, which clearly didn't work because people have lost their lives because of it. Um, and we've got all this old technology that lasts, 
and lasts and lasts and lasts, and we could learn a lot from it, but we don't. We, 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 we have a tendency to ignore old technology, trying to reinvent something or, or invent something different, and it never seems to work. And, and we, can, we can learn by the mistakes that the Victorians made by destroying our churches, but we don't do it. We think we can always do one better. And, and it's been proven in London that we can't. Um, hang, hang on a minute. It's, it's not combustible. It's a stone. It's not combustible. It allows the walls to breathe. And when whitewash itself, um, in whitewash itself, um, would, would, would keep a building cool, you know? So it, it's, you know, if, if you... Yeah, exactly, exactly. So all, all these properties. Anyway, anyway, moving on, moving on, moving on. Um, in the Roman period, we had something known as the flare kiln. The flare kiln was where the fuel and the lime um, are kept separate. Um, and this is, um, if I show you this now, that's a type of flare kiln, okay? Um, a flare kiln, is, 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 this is a different type of kiln, it's known as a continuous flame kiln, but, but just go with me on this. A flare kiln would work um, where you add the, the limestone, okay? You gradually draw it, and eventually, as you gravel, you break the limestone into gravel, as you draw it, you've got heat coming from the side, and that, that um, the coal itself, and all the charcoal, all the slag, wouldn't mix up and blacken and tarnish the colour of, of the limestone in the flare kiln, okay? So it would be beautifully pure when you're using it, which was a perfect building material for the Romans themselves. Um, and this was a technique used in Roman times, the line, where the lime was burnt and made good quality mortars. Intermittent um, kilns. Now, an intermittent kiln is this one. An intermittent kiln is where you've got um, wood charcoal. It's known as cord wood here. Wood charcoal, limestone, wood charcoal, limestone. It keeps going. Nice alternating layers. So, so at least, because what happens, it, it, it sets a light. All this happens over about four, four days. Okay? So the um, stone coal here, this is lit, burning the first layer um, of charcoal and wood and, and coal itself. Now as all that breaks down, the lime falls into it. And then above that, the next layer is set to light. So as the white stuff is drawn from below, the next layer, so the heat rises. So by the time you're drawing the lime off, the heat is actually going through the system, okay? And by the time you've drawn it off, the heat has moved to the top and it's safe to draw off because the, the, the actual heat itself of the kiln is going. In my notes, it makes, I think, a classic mistake which I really struggle to deal with. Um, we don't really know as much as we could about the limestone industry. Um, but it says in these notes and every, every other notes, uh, set of notes, which I really disagree with, it says that most limestone burning is done in the winter. But there's a huge problem with that. And the problem is, this lime itself, when it reacts to water, it, set, it starts to set. So if you're gonna, if you're needing four or five days for this thing to burn and to cool down, all you need is one downpour of rain, and the lime kiln itself, you need to evacuate quite quickly because it's going to have explosive properties. So to be involved in the limestone industry in the winter seems to me not to be a goer. But then again, I'm only going by my historical notes. Um, right. The, so the intermittent kiln, where it's all mixed up, as we've already shown you, is where everything's in alternating layers, left to burn for four or five days, allowed to cool, emptied roughly a week's work. A typical kiln took two tons of limestone in largest pieces um, and half a ton or a ton of coal. So that would be at intermittent stages and with some other material chucked in for good matter, measure. And um, this, this, one, this one itself here, that description is actually inaccurate. A mixed feed 
in the kiln is kept burning. What it should say um, is that you know, this, is, this is wrong from, from the diagram I'm going to show you. And the reason why it's wrong from the diagram of a perpetual kiln, a draw kiln, a continuous kiln, a run, running kiln is in fact that there. Uh, where in fact that's where all the burning material is and that is where all the calcining goes. That is where all the limestone is being placed. And as it's being, what's happening here is as it's still hot, it's being drawn from below. So the next load of limestone can actually heat, heat up. And then when that's done, it's drawn. You don't use large chunks. If you use large chunks, the outside is heated, but the stuff inside isn't. And you can imagine, you chuck that in water, and if the thing explodes, you're going to do some real damage. Because the stone itself is still stone-like inside, so you need small bits as you're heating it up. Let's go on a bit more. Yeah, the chimney is open at the top, yeah. Um, so what we do, we have vertical kilns. Um, many are on average about um, four metres high. You can get some up to about nine to ten metres high. A long, long, tall chimney uh, with diameters inside of uh, about two metres. Um, here's an interesting one. A warning from Alverston in Cumbria, the Sandwell kiln. The lime kiln is warm. The eye hole attracts vagrants as a place of shelter in cold weather. So um, that that there is the eye, eye hole, okay? But equally, people would lie directly on the top here as well, as the heat's coming out. And the reason the reason why. I'm telling you that people would have um, been lying up here as well. Is that if anyone, if any of you, ever watched um, the program Tudor Farm? Okay, um, the lad in there who was, who was an archaeologist. They, they all dressed up in costume for a month and they had to plough the fields and all the rest of it. It was filmed for the BBC or whatever. Um, in Tudor Farm, um, one of them had to be. Um, a, a, a limestone a burner and um, and as he was describing it the limestone burner had to stay with the kiln for four or five days but vagrants if they were lying in the eye hole below they they would be uh, intoxicated by the fumes coming out but if they were lying on the top of the mouth and lying on the wall on top of the mouth they described that people would be asphyxiated by the carbon dioxide coming off, okay? And they would just roll in. And nobody would ever know that they died because the heat, the temperatures would be so high that as they're drawing them from below, the bones would be a chalky mass with everything else, not a chalky mass, a lime mass from, with everybody else, uh, and it would just be drawn out and spread on the fields. So in other words, <laughs> If, if you want to get rid of your husband quickly, just tell him to um, get warm um, at the mouth of the lime kiln itself. Oh, kids going to try and live on They were. Yeah. Yeah. They, they found a tramp in their bonfire. Yeah. What? The tramps had gone to sleep in their bonfire. You know, they did their bonfire over the week and school holidays and they'd play and then there was a tramp in there. So they could have set light to it and they'd been killed? Hang on, you've got the plate. That's cruel. No, I don't think they got to sleep because they had to come back to one morning. Man, there's a tramp in the bonfire. Taking some of you and sending him to Oh, you're a lovely woman. No, I didn't. I said, get him out of there. Oh, shut up. You're making this up as you go along. There was a tramp in their bonfire. Is that the only fact with this story? Well, you just said they uh, vagrants. Like, vagrants, exactly. I'm glad you thought of the tramp. Uh, right. So here we go. The lime kiln is, a, is warm. The eye hole attracts vagrants as a place of shelter in cold weather. But carbon dioxide is a heavy gas. 
and there is a real danger of asphyxiation. One instance, two men died at Samwell Kill near Olverston in 1839. So you can imagine that they just, that's it, gas gets them. They go their funny way. Right, moving on. But that wouldn't be carbon monoxide though, is it? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Um, now this is a nice interesting little one. Here we go. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on my hands and knees. So here we go. Oh, I know I've got one there, but my bag is more important, and, and, it, and it's sitting on it. Uh, this is uh, this is from a, a certain Mr. Payne's microcosm from 1808. Lime is an article of great consideration, not only from its utility for various purposes, but from the employment which the manufactory of it affords to thousands. From the quantity used in building houses, walls, plastering. Um, it forms an important item in the national expenditure. So in other words, it's really important to our um, economy back in 1808, and it was up until recent decades. The consumption of it has also of late greatly increased by its successful application to agricultural purposes, by our improving farmers. Lime in the soil neutralizes acidity. Most plants require a slightly um, alkaline soil to grow well. It also opens out, breaks down heavy clay soils, making them better drained and more easily worked. The soil um, also becomes a better environment for bacterial processes such as nitrogen fixing. Initially, the soil might need a dressing of three to five tons per acre. The lime leaches out and has to be replaced but only uh, one to two um, tons per acre every four to six years. So you can sit, you can tell if you're a farmer, you need a lot of this. Um, so it's probably the farmer would have had his own lime kilns. Um, putting a, a silly hand to keep an eye on it and suddenly it disappears, you know where he's gone. Um, so every every four to six years, maybe seven years, you, you'd, you'd um, add um, an, another ton of lime to um, every acre. Enough to uh, sweeten the soil. Lump lines straight from the lime kiln in the rocky shapes that went into the kiln can be spread over the land, covered with earth, left to slake, ploughed in when it has gone to powder. Already slaked lime can be brought to be spread on the land. Without the constant application of lime and draining, the valley soils would revert to peaty moss land. Um, now you can imagine this, right? And this leads me on to the next bit, and then we'll have a break. You can imagine this. You're a farmer. Yeah. You are. You, you never ever come across this application of putting stones on a field before. Somebody says, look, I've eaten these stones up in a kiln, right? They're limestones, and a farmer's saying, I'm not putting them on my field. They say, go put them on your field. And a farm, the farmer's got his leather gloves on, and he's chucking one of the stones on the field, right? He said, but I'm chucking stones on a field, it's no good for me. I'll only have to plough them out. And the man said, look, just, just leave it. And suddenly there's a back downpour of rain, right? Oh and suddenly, the stone sets a light. And you say, he's evil, he's the devil. And he's put on the stool and drowned. Poor bugger. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can imagine, um, it would be, it's difficult for me to try and get my mind around that, that water can create fire. It, it's a it really difficult concept. But can you imagine how that would have felt um, 500 years ago? Some, it, would be a, it would be the level of alchemy, the level of, 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 of speciality that, that would have given somebody great power. Can, can, you, can you imagine, right? Somebody's, somebody's just about to attack your house, right? Uh, and it's a dry day, right? And you thought, right, we'll, we'll have all these limes, this, th these limestones ready. We've heated them up, right? And then you spray them with water, and they all set a light. Nobody's going to come near you again, unless with a gang of soldiers to have you arrested and hung as being a witch. Um, and this leads me on to this next story, um, Borrowdale Tales. Um, there is an unsinkable tradition of tales about Borrowdale, which is in the heart of Cumbria, uh, near Barrow and Furness. Um, it is said that an old Borrowdale man was sent a very long way for something very new by some innovator who had found his way into the dale. The man was to go with horse and sacks 
for there were no carts because there was no road to bring some lime from beyond Keswick. Now I've got a bit of a problem with this. If you're carrying several sacks of lime, they're going to be very heavy and you're not going to get found with them. So at some point you must have loaned the cart. On his return, uh, when he was near Grange, it began to rain and he thought, I'll just carry on. And the man was alarmed at seeing his sacks begin to smoke. Not like this, but they were smoking. There's a um, smoke start that comes with the sacks. He got a handful of, he got, said, a hatful of water from the river. So he said, I'll get this fire out now. Oh. But the smoke grew worse. A shod at length of the dev devil must be in any fire which was aggravated by water. So obviously all the sacks set alight. He tossed the whole load over, the, over into the river and never went back again. So in other words, and people just didn't understand this, but the, the, the moral of the story is never get this stuff wet because if you do, you're going to lose your cart and your sacks. Right, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. Can you read the last sentence of the Borrow Dale Tales? What, what is that? You've got the hat, that's um, a hat full of water. No, 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 that's above there. What, that, that there? Yeah, calcium and yeah. chalk. Yeah, basically this is about... Um, it's about the, the, the chalky landscapes of Wiltshire where they've got no, where, where they do have limestone, but and chalk, what yeah, is that? calcium as chalk marl. marl. So basically, marl is it, marl is like a very soft, um, um, a very soft sh shaly type rock. Okay. Dug yeah. From so marl dug from marl pits at least as early as the 1400s has been used for soil improvement. So basically, you're digging this stuff and more or less, I think, just chucking it on the field. But lime burned with coal was used at least as early as the um, 1200s in Britain. We know so this technology. Is a different thing altogether, then. Yes, yes. Right, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. Um, we're going to have to rattle a tea bag. Could he be in the room? I must have been bigger. Could he Yeah, but you, you used to go to school with the uh, um, baryonics, didn't you? Or Who? Baryonics. Bar <laughs> Right, just a I'm little. Right, what the hell has that got to do with lime kilns? Now this um you you were you were right um that you mentioned that lime kilns are important because they are. Uh when 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 I started this today I said that um lime kilns have very many applications and um as as a substance it's is probably second to water with the amount of applications that um lime can have. And this is interesting. This is at Forest Vower, a UNESCO global geopark. Yes. What? Forest Vower. Scattered across the geopark, Forest Vower, the Bracken Beacons, are lime kilns of different shapes and sizes and various states of collapse, uh, many in a good state of preservation. They are a reminder of a past industry, a very important past, in, past industry. Uh, the burning of limestone produced quick lime um, was was very important, but because without it, um, the industrial revolution would never have taken place. Um, all those many buildings that needed to be required um, as factories, um, furnaces, and so on, all relied upon um, lime itself, quick lime, being slaked to bind those stones and those bricks together. Uh, lime was in widespread use for making lime mortar before the advent of modern cement. Basically, cement itself um, comes from limestone as much as lime comes from limestone, but cement, there's other ingredients added um, and there's a completely different process. Uh, both, I may add, are, are toxic, but with um, cement, when you add water, it sets straight away. When you add water to lime, 
it takes many, many years to set properly. So this is, um, I just wanted to sort of put that on there. Um, and lime kilns were constructed where limestone and fuel for burning it could be brought together. Um, and this, this is very important as well because um, with, without the links to move it around the country if you're producing large amounts of material, uh, without um, coal and timber being available and without water to um, slake it anyway, um, you know, none of this would have been possible. So it all had to come together. Uh, many lime kilns um, are alongside canals. Uh, lots of those canals were being constructed from the 1750s onwards. Uh, roads. Um, the, the concept of roads was sort of coming in, you know, decent roads was coming in um, with a certain um, general, uh, general uh, wave in Scotland uh, with um, making sure that the um, Jacobite rebellion never ever happened again. Um, so roads were being built in Scotland from about the 17 late 1740s, 1750s onwards, and then the advent of railways, um, if we want to look at Trevithick um, in 1806, and that's the period from the railways onwards. So all of this, all of these were associated vis-a-vis -vis, uh, with limestone quarrying. And I think, it, I think it's wonderful that I could just gently just go through these slides as I'm doing. Um, this is, um, this is a, a little video um, from Ayrshire in Scotland, which we're going to show. What's that? What part? No. I, I will show you now. North Ayrshire. Highfield Lime Kiln, North Ayrshire. Oh, I'm from North Ayrshire. Are you? Yeah. Mm. Highfield. 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 Uh, is the shelter that was used to keep the um, the quick lime dry because we don't need to go on um, about why you need to keep it dry. Um, and then as as it moves on, it, it's not often. I'm not really sure that what that feature is, but it's it's not often that um, a site like this is being excavated because we always associate, we always think of the lime kiln itself. Um, and we don't think of any buildings associated with it, i.e. being used to um, store uh, the product before it's uh, used in its varying industries. Um, and there, usually what you find is kilns came in twos. There's one here and there's another arch for one here. They usually came in twos because as the one is, is cooling, the other one is being filled, and as you're drawing from the one, uh, the other one's cooling, and then you can load it. So you've usually got more than one kiln. Very intense. What was in the ground along the castle? What do you mean? Ah, right. In the grounds of Ogmore Castle, there's a lime kiln. Oh, what did it look like? Couldn't remember what it was. Yeah, it's the lime kiln. Um, and we, when we went to, um, uh, was it Carrie Canning Castle? There, there was a lime kiln there as well, oh. if you can remember. But the thing is, you can. These can all double up as um, pottery kilns as well. Oh, that was the one that Peter gave me, that one. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, oh, we can't do that, but isn't it great? A whole railway track completely abandoned. Oh, what was on that? Caboni. Did you, did you remember this railway track? thing is he's, he's talking about this and but lots of the information to what these things would be in use for because it was wartime none of it was written down and all the records were destroyed or put in um, store um, I, I, I this is an accident that we're seeing this but I, I think it's absolutely fascinating we've got platforms and we got the track still there um, which you don't get anything like this in in South Wales mainly 
unless you're living in that silly place called My Steg, where you've got a station building and a track, and it's completely ignored and abandoned, which really frustrates me. Is there? And it's still there? Oh, right. Anyway, let's move on. Anyway. <laughs> Next. See what I said? Right. Okay, what I wanted to show you was this. Uh, we, we've mentioned lots about lime kilns. We've mentioned a little bit about Roman ones. Uh, this is the Porth Madog Bypass Reveals More Roman Life. Um, this is 2010, this is. But I, I'm absolutely fascinated because about 20 years ago, right, I can remember archaeologists turning around and historians said, there was nothing in North Wales at all. Absolutely nothing in the Roman period. It was full of people who wandered around, pretended to be druids, dressed in wood. And now, by Abergavenny, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> Do you know what? Cathy's dreading going to North Wales because she knows I'm going to talk like this at every opportunity, you see. <laughs> she absolutely hates me doing it. But anyway. Uh, over the past couple of decades, we found that there's Roman villas there. We know about the mining industry in Paris Mountain, which we're going to see. Uh, we don't land there, no uh, mining, which we've known for a while. And we got the Roman base at Holyhead and uh, Sagontium. But we now know that they had settlements there. And how do we know this? Because there is a lime kiln. It's a proper, proper lime kiln. Look at that. It's big, isn't it? That's, that's a proper lime kiln. In, it's, it's cut into the rock. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so basically, you've got the face here, and, and this is against the face, and the, and, and, and the jaw point is at the bottom, yeah. So artifacts discovered on the route of the New Porth Madog bypass are making archaeologists rethink the way the Romans lived in the area. Uh, the most significant find, a large uh, lime kiln, was previously hidden under an earthen mound. The 34.4 million pound bypass, you plonker. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and you and Parry from the Trust said as follows. We're not set on other dates yet. Because Radio Car, oh, stop it. <laughs> because Radio Carbon dating has, has not been carried out. So this is really the beginning of the research we'll have to carry out. Um, basically, the kiln itself, four metres on the base. I think that's internal did they not measurement. Did they no, they didn't. It was completely by accident. But what they did know um, was that in the 1920s, they did some work there, and they, they found loads of roofing tiles, which they couldn't work out um, what building it was connected to. Um, and it basically says that um, the site itself was on some kind of islet, um, so obviously the, the kiln, the limestone had to be taken out, uh, take, no, the lime itself had to be taken off the island to be used in building elsewhere, but there's evidence that they've got, um, that they've got evidence of roofing there for, for a substantial room builder, but the main thing interesting to us is actually the lime kiln. Right, let's move on to... So slates were found in Chester? Yeah, that's right. Similar slates were found in the barrack blocks of Chester, yeah, that's right. Here we go. This is the last bit tonight, and there's nothing wrong with a bit. Is that a kiln? Yeah, 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 that, 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 that there, this is a kiln, and that's the article. Burning the bones of the earth lime kilns. So this is at Porth Gain in West Wales. Yes, we have a two bin, right next to it. Do you? Where is that? Porth Gain. Where is 
Do you, do you know? Do you know what? Right? Yeah, I, I was that filled up. Hang, hang on, hang on a minute. Hang, hang on a minute. Hang. No, it hasn't washed away. Don't be so silly. Yeah, actually, how, how was that loaded up? I'm just asking you. Because it had to be loaded from the top. No, I'm. A, this is a this is a typical example. I'm going with my notes, right? And I haven't questioned that real single fact. How is that filled up? It's saying it is. It's saying. This is about lime kilns. I think this is this is wrong. That's not a lime kiln. That's an op house. Oast house. Oast. Well, actually, for once, right, you've spotted a problem with this entire lecture that that is wrong, and so is the article wrong because that's not a lime kiln. Anyway, moving on. Explore the now ruined estates of the Irish countryside, and you find um, stone cylinders. Yeah. Yeah, if it's a quarry area, it's saying that this was a lime kiln. So now what we've done is I've been using this and it's completely wrong. Anyway, um, oh, shut up. Right, the whole point is that is that you have a you have a cliff face, right, and you and you load it from the top of the cliff face and you've got the furnace at the bottom. Okay? Um, like this. So so if you if you got something like that there. Spoiler is playing silly buggers. It's your fault, Dorothy, you've ruined my day. Yeah, that's right. There it is there. You 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 can see it there where it's loading from the top. In there to build up. That's right. And then draw from below. I.e. like that, that's the face, and that's up against the um the cliff face. Uh, there is one. There is one. Um, when, when we're looking for um, lime kilns in the Roman period, say for example, the quarries. Say it's quarried in the medieval period. So say you've got the lime kiln here, and there's the rock face. Uh, as the rock face is mined, the lime kiln has to move with the rock, rock face, because if you've got a, a lime kiln there, it can't be filled anymore. Because there's no rock face to fill it. See what I mean? So you've got to, you've got to be able to fill it from above to have something above it to fill it. So therefore, um, this lime kiln has to keep moving. So you've got to demolish it, use the stone somewhere else, and they've got to move it as the rock face is moving to actually be loaded from above. That's a very good point, that is. I've learned something. Yeah. Uh, what you just mentioned being uh, against the country. Not like that there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So in other words what sort of state is it when it comes out? Is it burning through charcoal or wood and no, no base, basically, as I as I said, as I said, um, if you use anthracite, mm -hmm. uh, anthracite um, burns much um, more purer than any other coal, and what you're going to get is little flecks in it, right? But if you're using normal charcoal, um, what what you do, um, you get um, you get loads of um, you get loads of flecks in it. So when you're building, it's not that pure. But what what would happen is in the um, in the in the um, in the flare kiln, the continuous kilns, okay, what they would do, they they, they would they would heat them from the side, and and as the um, as the little bits of lime are being heated, they they fall beyond the griddle, right. and they're drawn out, mm -hmm. so it's continuous. That was the flare one. That's the flare one, flare. the continuous one, yeah. Um, anyway, let, let's get back to where we are because I'm painfully aware that we could be here all day. Um, so obviously, we're now looking at that image and we've worked out that there's a problem with it. So let's move on. 
Um, let's just ignore all that now um, because it doesn't make any sense. Lime here means neither the citrus fruit nor the tree, but refers to a white powder derived from limestone. For at least 7,000 years, humans created lime kilns. Uh, we now know that they probably date back as far as 14,000 years, as they might have hardened pottery or smelted ore and used the material for dozens of purposes now largely replaced by fossil fuel products. So what, what we're basically saying is that, um, um, yeah. What is fossil fuel? Actually? Fossil fuel is, is the, um, fossil fuel is basically gas, oil, coal. Uh, perhaps the most common, the what's that? I know a bit sick, but they always say fossil fuel. I always thought they were fossils that they burned from. Oh, fossils, like, you know, I, I, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry. You're right. Be <laughs> yep, yeah, you're right. right. Because there's fossilized trees that they're burning. Uh, right. So you've got it right. Yeah. But basically, in the archaeological sites that they've been excavating. You've no. They haven't found, that's the point, we, we haven't found the evidence of the lime kilns, but, but the use of lime, stone being heated up, that evidence has been found for 14,000 years. Yeah, hang on, we've got to get on to that, that's my fact, you've taken away the glory. British and Irish farmers, though found it most important to neutralise acidic soils and multiply crop production as much as fourfold, by some contemporary accounts, for hundreds of years until the 1900s, lime supported a vast and vital network of village industry. Quarries to mine the limestone, carts and barges to transport it, and specialists to monitor the burning. In the late 1700s, according to one survey, County Cork alone was said to contain an amazing 23,000 kilns, or one, one every um, 80 acres. So that means even though all 23,000 kilns weren't at use at any one time, so say that 15,000 were, you would have needed at least one person to have um, filled up those lime kilns, then to draw everything off and to fill it up again and all the rest of it. Uh, so that's a lot of people involved in just one industry. It was a very, very populous industry. Limestone, um, as, as we already know, is made up of, of muds, um, long extinct sea creatures and stuff, all, all of us squeezed together. I'm interrupting you once again. Go on, go I for it. I can't get my head around it because it's, it's them, that all those little things, <laughs> there's such a lot of them that you... It's, it's, so, com it's so compacted, yeah. I just can't get my head around them. It's so, it's so compacted, loads yeah. Loads and loads and loads of them, how many millions of them? Trillions, billions. Trillions. Don't you find it amazing that we've seen all those things being... So, so, so to get clarity, right, this is an important note. When you've got the calcium oxide after the stone has been heated up, um, when you add the water, it becomes hydrated to create the quick line required in building. Hydrated means basically added water. Yes, water. Um, so here we go, Roman concrete. Um, the, the, the earliest use of lime dates to present day Turkey between 7,000 to 14,000 years ago, which I think is a very important piece of information. And many ancient civilizations used it to create um, mortar between stones, as much as for other, a lot of other reasons as well. The Romans, however, took lime a step further, mixing it with various other ingredients to create an early version of cement. In fact, their version has pro proven superior to our own in some ways, many ways I would say. Our concrete lasts only decades, as we see when we're demolishing tower blocks in London have only been standing 30 years, they start to decay quite rapidly. Uh, while Romans created concrete that not only formed in seawater, but have withstood the pounding of waves for 2,000 years. And you look at that image there, those, those holes there are not putt logs, they're basically two beams that come out to have a canopy and an individual actually work under that, stop the rain getting up. Yeah. Is it an extra arch as well on the top of that, or did they change their minds? 
Um, the arches themselves are to give strength to the wall. So um, you've got the internal arch here, and then they've um, they, they've obviously they're doing that to um, give strength to the wall as much as anything. Are we still producing linemen at Frontenac? I do believe we must be. Yes. Well, I used this stuff for about fifteen years, and it was all French. Mm. Back in France. All right. They try to get up there, travel up, pick it up, and bring it back. Keep on going to one of your maps and tell me how Which ones? British. Don't, don't, don't show up, Dorothy. British line. That's that, that that's um that's um, George's old mate Ethel. Mm, it's all coming up with Yeah, I I reckon they, they must exist. We must be producing our own lime still. There can't be all that gone. It's not coming up. Mm. Uh, was that made by Lafarge as well? Yeah. Mm. The Farge. I, I did a. Um, I, I I had a. Um, I can't remember what it was. I I I, I played the evil Baron Lafarge. Oh. Uh, basically, Lafarge. It, it was it was a take of um, of 007. Lafarge with an evil um, cement magnate. He, he he was he was causing problems for 008. Actually, yeah. Um, the secret, according to two papers of, of Roman um, cement, involved mixing quicklime with volcanic ash to form mortar. Volcanic ash was plentiful, gathered from the volcano at Vesuvius, according to Pliny the Elder. Ironically, the same volcano that would kill him, uh, because he would be um, overtaken by the fumes of the eruption of uh, Mount Vesuvius in August um, AD 79. Uh, Romans then packed this mortar into wooden forms and lowered them into the sea, which caused the quick lime to react and form a lime and wash mix or water pr proof cement. Um, it also says this. Um, the, the, um, the papers author authors um, say such techniques could prove useful even today. Not only did their concrete stand up to time and the elements between um, uh, bet uh, elements better than ours, but um, such methods are greener, generating less, less carbon emissions than um, our cement manufacturer. Crushing rocks into Portland cement powder requires enormous quantities of energy um, and accounts for 7% of all industrial carbon emissions on the planet. So the old way was better. What is actually is that? This here? Yeah. That's another lime kiln. As I said, double kilns. So it's not very high. Ah, it, it is fed from behind. And they, they, some of them didn't need to be massively high. There, there's one at um, usually about four metres in height. If you go to, if you go to Park Labreos, uh, the giant's grave on the Gower, as you're looking at the burial chamber at Park Le Greos, there's a uh, Breos, there's a there's a lime kiln, uh, which stands about um, which stands about um, four and a half five meters in height, and it's and it's set directly into the carboniferous lot, rock. And this is the only example where I've actually been able to go and stand into the lime kiln because they put a grid over it. They put a metal grid, and you can see how big it is. And from below, you can see the metal grating and stuff, and you can get into the the eye itself. It's great. There, there are examples like these, these still standing in Vale Morgan um, near, um, near Goldsland Wood, which is immediately south of Dufferin itself. Um, and sometimes the walls are dry stone and there's an internal line in. Some of them use the lime itself to connect the stone together, which is quite ironic, really. Um, so the Romans, it said, brought, um, brought such technologies 
um, with them uh, when they started con conquering Europe. Um, so lime kilns appear in Britain with their invasion, and then they disappear for a while, and they come back. And they're a very piece of technology in Ireland in about the 1200s. Oh, well, well, listen to this. Lime also forms the basis of whitewash, which we've already said. Uh, not only for structures, can be used for fences, vehicles, and even trees. I've been trying to work out that vehicle bit. Without allowing an unpronounceable stew of toxic ingredients, as you see in many paints. But if you don't cover yourself up when, when, it's, when um, the quick lime is being slaked mm -hmm. and you're adding water to it, if you don't cover yourself up, you could have a great deal of problems that you could have easily avoided. Uh, whitewash is fundamentally a mix of lime and water, although it could also contain salt, milk, lin milk linseed oil for waterproofing, hair or cereal husks. Now this next... Yes. I had a girlfriend once and I phoned her up. I said, um, I, 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 I've i got problems with um, getting all my volunteers on site to pee into a bucket because um, I, I need the active ingredient of the urine to react with the lime um, and the horse hair. We had horse hair. I remember talking to this woman on the phone. She said, oh, well, I'll come down and pee into the bucket for you. And I said, actually, your pee isn't going to be good enough. Oh, then she slammed the phone down on me. Uh, your pee isn't going to be good enough because it's going to be male pee. And she said, all I was doing was offering to pee into a bucket. And you can't accept that off me. And she slammed the phone down on me. Well, it wasn't far off that. In a bucket. No. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. It's about two inches thick. Yeah. And you take the binder off, and as you're mixing the stuff, you just peel it off and soak it down and let it mix around. You've used it as well. It's great stuff, isn't it? It's good. It's used to this day. Binds it to t together. Um, uh, Internally, yeah. You can use it outside if you want, but internally, yeah. This is wrapped up a busy. Yes. Oh. And then we throw in uh, seashells. That's good. Small, small. Small ones. The very small ones, yeah. And then when it, when it rains and it comes to the surface, you can see them in the actual cement. Yeah, because the the water just drains off. And they would be in between the bricks then. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the dried lime was safe to handle when it was dried. So when it when it um like right. you have a calcium carbonate, the rock, and you have calcium on one side before you add water to it, before you add it, then it goes back to carbon which then comes in this next bit, dried lime then, was safe to handle and even for animals to lick, but remained mildly alkaline enough to disinfect barn and dairy walls. Um, its brilliant whiteness was valued in places like Britain and Ireland, uh, where the winters grow very dark. Irish cottages were traditionally whitewashed in spring and again before um, Christmas. In sunnier climates, however, that same colour helped to keep buildings cool. So I, you know, I, I, I've got to, I've got to finish with the virtues of, of, of lime in a moment. So I'm gonna to have to get through. This. But that there is Lindisfarne. Can you imagine? Uh, Lindisfarne had a large lime burning industry. The island itself off the coast of Northumberland. Um, no, there wouldn't have been any monks on Lindisfarne in 1860. But it's likely. Um, that the monks would have been involved um, in the um, lime industry. Do you know what, right? Um, I, I learned something from these classes. Well, I've obviously learned one thing today, one realisation. Um, but, um, you know, whenever I'm doing my myths and legends walks along the coast, I always talk about monks being evil, sinister people who used to deliberately wreck ships, which they did. Um, they were much in on it as everybody else. And I always say, you know, there wasn't enough money in... Um, selling, um, you know, selling their corn and all the rest of it. They were highly rich, more than you would have ever got, ever got for selling corn. And then, a few months ago, I started realising that the main industry in Lantwerp Major was lime, and that's where the monks made their money. Um, you know, you learn these things as you progress. Um, 
So, lime had many other uses. Farmers, and we've done that bit, farmers rubbed it um, on their livestock feet as an antiseptic or painted it onto fruit trees to protect against fungal disease. Some mixed a bit of lime into well water to disinfect it or to preserve eggs for months without spoiling. Um, tanners used it to remove hair from hides. Gardeners to repel slugs and snails. Printers to bleach paper. Um, even, the uh, even the corrosive quicklime, the calcium carbonate that came straight from the kiln, had many uses before it was hydrated. This is important. It kept pantries and storerooms dry. The 19 in 1915, the household manual, the best way, recommended keeping a bowl of it to reduce humidity as it sucked moisture from the air. It caught fire easily, sometimes too easily, and was used to make an early high intensity lamp for the stage. An exothermic reaction. That's it! it exothermic reaction. I knew somebody would remember it. And basically, when you're, when you, I think you need to leave now. When, when you're on stage and somebody says, Carl, you're in the limelight. Ah! The, in, the in, that's Yeah. The original. I'm the original limelight. Oh. Blow me down. What did you say it was? I can't remember. Exothermic reaction. Exo, exo, exterior, thermic, um, reaction, chemical reaction. Uh, terrorist weapon. Just think about this, right? Did you know I was doing, I, I was doing, do, I, I was looking at how many, how many uh, oh God, battles the French ever won at sea, right? There's about five in the entire history of the French state compared to hundreds that the British have had. A one battle could have been won by the French in 1216 if the English captain hadn't had lime on board. Listen to this. In the history of, uh, of England, in David Hume's book, he writes about the English and a French battle where um, there was an English captain known, Philip, known as Philip de Albany in 1216. The tide of the battle was turning in the favour of the French. And alas, Philip could not see um, him being defeated. So, ingeniously, he used quicklime to turn the tide of battle. He saw that the winds were blowing from his ships to, French, to the French fleet. And having gained the wind of the French, he came down upon them with violence and throwing it into the Frenchmen's faces, which he purposely carried on board. He so blinded them that they were disabled from defending themselves. Vis-a-vis, -vis, he won the battle. Why can't the English ever fight fairly? They never fight fairly. I know, Bill, I know. Basically, a lime kiln factory in Prague, massive industry, late um, 18, 1900. Uh, just think about this. You can use it in terrorism as a terrorist weapon. Uh, Charles Pennell speaking at a rally in 1891 had lime thrown into his face. He was nearly blinded. Um, here we go. Uh, Dorothy putting on bodies. Quick lime uh, was also shoveled into graves to uh, decompose bodies more quickly, as Oscar Wilde saw when he was a prisoner at Reading Jail. Um, and as it goes, <coughs> and all the while the burning lime eats flesh and bone away. It eats the brittle bone by night and the soft flesh by the day. It eats the flesh and bone by turns, but eats the heart away. Do you know, I could have had more of that. That's true enough. That's true enough. And, and look at this. We, we're going to have to finish in a minute. Um, lime and agricultural sweetening the soil. 40% of the, of the arable uh, land in the world is too acidic for plants to grow, so you add lime. Um, and um, so it sweetens it. Um, and here we go. Um, in, in Ireland, um, in the 1600s, uh, families in County Cork, when, when they were down on their luck, um, would, uh, do, would uh, have lime building as a sideline so they could actually uh, pay the rent. And this is recorded in the civil surveys of the time. Uh, lime kilns in, in America, really tall ones. Um, fed from above, George, see that? Yeah. <laughs> um, farmers treated the soil in quite a straightforward manner. They shoveled um, quick lime straight from the kiln onto a horse's a drawn cart. It's not going to rain. Chuck it into the field and do a runner. Okay. Um, basically falls on the ground. Six to eight barrels per acre. That's the equivalent of uh, about two and a half tons. Um, spread in a highly um, caustic compound under crop land. 
might sound inadvisable, but the next rain both hydrated it into lime and soaked it into the ground, and it would kill any hor horrible bacteria and anything that was in the field. But if you went into the field um, and it started raining, your cart would burn vis-a-vis, -vis, you had to buy a new cart. Um, and this is a very important statement. Listen to this. Um, if you didn't sweeten your land, so basically, if you've got one acre of land for the first time, you're going to spread lime on it. It's, it's, it's PT horrible whatever land, right? So you spread one acre, about three or four tons of lime on it, which is about two, two and a half fires from a lime kiln, which is about three days work. So you, uh, three days, three weeks work. So you spread it on the field. And every um, maybe six, seven years, you would, you would add to it another ton, okay? But this statement is very true. You make sense of this. Enrich the father, but impoverish the son. So basically, the father may spread the lime on the field, but if he doesn't tell his son to do it, the son will be forever impoverished because his yield will be quartered. It'll only be a quarter of what his dad had. So he had to add lime to it. Um, and basically, just, just in closing, so we've got um, uh, the, the idea somewhere like this. Uh, this is the... Um, uh, this is in Dudley. This is the, um, I think, th this is the Liverpool, um, br no. li Liverpool Bradford Canal. It doesn't actually say it on there, but there's Liverpool Bradford Canal in 1842. And, and basically, you can imagine um, that um, that somehow they're, they're getting the um, quick lime into those badges in barrels, taking them to another location before they got wet. Um, so there you go, along the canal, because they're, they're, they're drawing from below, feeding from above. Good one, George. Um, sometimes you don't see the obvious. Um, the kiln has to be carefully filled, um, careful amounts of, of, of lime and careful amounts, ratios of coal and, um, or furze wood, um, special wood, um, which have been uh, dried, the driest of wood um, in the kiln. And the site being used. Um, coal, anthracite coal being used, obviously anthracite places like Wales. And last, last thing here, uh, we'll, we'll mention this, sleeping by the kiln. Um, and here we go, uh, you would have needed a watcher um, to keep an eye on the kiln, um, line burners, um, and basically what we mentioned earlier on with poisonous gases from the open pit would come out, the mouth and poisonous gases from the eye itself. There were cases of itinerant sleeping near the mouth of, for warmth, he said, rolling into it as they slept, being roasted alive, and they wouldn't feel any of it. They'd be so gassed out, the next thing they would do would be wake up in heaven and think, well, where the hell am I? Or fire hell. Maybe they weren't very nice people. Um, and cer certainly uh, men and women would have a thirst. Um, thirsty as a lime burner, it would make you very thirsty. Um, drawing out the lime underneath was the dirtiest part of it. Um, a man in a documentary in 1981 um, wrote um, from the 1930s and 1940s. And just quickly, this last one, uh, the idea of alchemy, uh, the idea that you're transferring rock um, and then suddenly it's, it's setting itself alight uh, by adding water. In one instance, fairies were said to have killed off a farmer's livestock after he inadvertently built a kiln in their way. Other people were said, this is all island after all, they're barking over there. Other people were said to have summoned evil spirits there, a uh, reverend in Khan money, rumoured to have sold his soul to the devil, was said to have courteously invited him to um, a kiln so the devil would feel at home. The line burners themselves had a simpler ritual, one they said was practiced among all the line burners of old. And this final bit of this went as follows. Ooh, you took a bottle with you that morning of holy water, one said, and before the kiln was fired up, you just sprinkled it on top of stones and made a sign of a cross. For you were burning what they used to say was, you were burning the bones of the earth. So therefore, this is why you had to have holy water. On that moment, I'm going to call it a day. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Have you all enjoyed it today? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? What's that? Yeah, go on. Give us that last thing about the poachers. This is really relevant. Go for it. An empty bottle. You put two or three kettles of lime. Kettles now. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Yeah. So much time. And maybe three, four, five minutes later, we'll get it. That's fun to fish. Oh my god, I actually thought you I actually thought you were talking about just poisoning the water, but no, this is to this is to kill him. This is to kill them so they can just get it, walk in and pick them up. Oh do you know what, right? George had to know that one in Ayrshire, didn't he? On that note, have you all enjoyed us today? Yes, Thank you very much. I will see I will no doubt see you all next week. And next week we're doing aqueducts. Aqueducts, Roman, and they're reusing the medieval period. Thank you very much. We'll come back next week.